Welcome back, everyone. I have something that I am really excited to share with you guys today. This has been a long time in the making, and many of you know that I have been working a lot with Ralph Gibson over the last few years. I've talked about it a lot on this show. I've featured him on the show before. About 2020 or so, I had an opportunity to study with Ralph as part of his Advancing Photographer Workshop series. I also did some bookmaking workshops. He's somebody that I would consider not just a friend, but a mentor. He's somebody that I look up to with an immense amount of respect. He is one of the greatest photographers of his generation. An amazing career starting in the 1960s. He was part of the New York scene. He is still actively producing work today, and he is an enormous inspiration and somebody that I look up to a great deal. So Ralph Gibson has a new book that he has just completed called Refractions 2. I've got an unbound preview copy. I've read the whole thing. It is just phenomenal. This is really going to be exciting. A couple months ago, I had an opportunity to go up to Exton, Pennsylvania, which is right outside of Philadelphia, to go to the printer, which is Brilliant Graphics, who's Ralph is working with on this project project and do some interviews and some behind the scenes footage and I'm really excited because I'm going to share the first part of that with you guys in this video and I want to extend a very warm thank you to Leica for help making this project happen. Without their generosity and support this wouldn't have come together the way it did and I'm extremely grateful for that. We have now a product we are very proud of that we are happy to share with you. So this is part one of my discussion with Ralph Gibson. Since we were at the printer working on his book I thought it would be really interesting to get him to talk about the influence and inspiration that he drew from photography books and what it means to make a book in general. So without further ado, this is Ralph Gibson. Ralph, I want to circle back to um, a couple of years ago when I took your advancing photographer workshop. And one thing you said to me uh, during that time that seems very obvious, but I think a lot of people overlooked, is this whole idea of context. And what you said to me specifically was the great Henri Cartier-Bresson with the decisive moment. If he had called that book Henri's greatest hits, it might not have had the same ring as a book form or if, uh, if we look at uh, the Americans, if it were called Frank's Best. Context is important, and what role does context play to you uh, when you're addressing a new project or a new book? Well, to answer that question, we'll take a few steps back into the history of the printed page. We have to understand that almost everything I knew, anybody knew in the 50s and 60s was learned from books. If you, if you knew of a photographer, you knew about uh, their work either from the printed pages of Life magazine or the few books that were occasionally you could get your hands on. There was no way for a photographer to establish himself or herself other than through a book. Because everything I knew about photography in those days, as you mentioned, was a decisive moment. The American Photographs by Walker Owen, The Americans by Robert Frank, and a few others, you know, Ansel, uh, Edward Weston, my camera on Point Lobos. So this indicates instantly that any photographic recognition was going to come from a published body of work, you see. So uh, I wanted very much to... Uh, not be a photojournalist. I wanted to function as an independent, autonomous photographer. And I started working on my book, The Somnambulist. And fortunately, it took me three years to, to decide to publish it myself. I was in and out of several other publishing deals where people wanted to edit the book, and I wanted autonomy. And so we come to a point where The photographers that we all admired had books that were not just books, they were very good books, you see. I remember in 1970 a statistic which was probably accurate, which stated that all forms of publishing included 3,000 books a day were being published in America. Now, those were all kinds of books, as you can imagine. Now, the other thing is that at this time, if you went into the leisure section of a major bookstore, what you would see was a macrame, tie-dyeing, hippie stuff. 
uh, batik, uh, leather, leather butchery, things like that, wood butchery, how to, how to do stuff in the manner of the, the leisure hobby class, which was imitating hippie life. Around 1970, I came out with The Somnambulist. Uh, Duane came out with Things Are Queer. There were a few other books. Lee came out with Self Portrait. And all of a sudden, little by little, photography books started muscling out the, the hippie stuff and, and until you had a whole sec section in bookstores by 1973, 74 of art photography books. Now, any single one of these books many of which are in our collections today by prominent workers of the time, they all dealt with specific themes. You asked me to define the word context. Well, for example, if, uh, if I have a beautiful nude torso, abdomen and bosom of a beautiful uh, woman, I could say the breast of the Venus de Milo, and we would look at that torso within a certain context. If the title below it said, still no cure for breast cancer, that picture would look very different. We would, we would interpret it from a wholly entirely different point of view. So uh, that's why I say the somnambulist, which already says sleepwalker, and then in the brief two paragraph prologue, I state, while sleeping, a dreamer reappears elsewhere on the planet. And this is a book about this guy who prefers to be the dreamer. So now, all of a sudden, the photographs that you're looking at are not 48 photos by Ralph. They're about the somnambulist. So it's a situation where the book functions in a very important way, emphatically suggests how these photographs are to be viewed. So that's my answer to your question of context. When, when The Synabulous came out, and I've noted there are interviews with some of your colleagues from that era, uh, Mary Ellen comes to mind. In fact, I think specifically there's an interview in which she said uh, the buzz was this guy Ralph Gibson self-publishing. Mm -hmm. That was unusual in those days to do. And you mentioned before, you go through a press, you can get a book deal, but there's an editor who comes in and makes decisions for you and all. You were very driven to do that. I mean, that was not something that was common. I mean, what hopes did you have to jump through to get that done? And maybe that's the three-year timeline on that somewhat. Well, I have to say that by the time I was able to, I did a job at the MGM annual report. My friend Bob Overby got me this, and I used that money to pay the lithographer, right. pay the printer. Now, I have to say by the time I got the Synambulist printed, I really didn't care what anybody thought of it because I really knew what I thought about it. There was no doubt in my mind that this work for what I was intending to do, what I set out to achieve, had in fact performed that. So with this degree of, I guess I have to say confidence at the expense of my self-modesty. But with this, with this degree of confidence, you can publish, and you're not, really, you're not really vulnerable to the praise or the condemnation of others. Now, as it turns out, three months later, I, I had nothing but praise for the book, and I was established. But the one time I stood up and said, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it, turned out to be what made my career. You see, it's why I'm sitting in this chair today. And every book follows that. Yes, and, and so since that time... Uh, uh, I strongly, I'd strongly admonish photographers to take this position because who knows better what the artist is trying to do than the artist himself or herself. You're the one who know really, if you take the time. The fact that it took me three years to publish this in Ambulus, you know, I, I should point out in the first week I had the first 24 pages and the book's only 48 pages long. So uh, I really knew what those photographs were saying by the time I released them. Most photographers don't edit with that degree of, of uh, total fascism. You know. did, did it come naturally with the, I mean, the Black Trilogy being the first three, uh, did it come a little quicker once you realized that you had that control over your own work and you Good had question. that confidence? Uh, I knew two things, Ted. Right off the bat that I wasn't going to do Son of Somnambulus. <laughs> But at the end of every project, there's a few prints left over which are harbingers and indicate where I wanted to go next. 
And I thought a deja vu happens about as quick as a shutter release. And uh, I had always wanted to use uh, that as a, as a way of searching for my next photograph. Well, in the cover of Days at Sea is the plume, which is probably your most well-known photograph, would you say? It's one of them, yes. I think Mary Jane Sardinia has eclipsed it, but uh, <laughs> uh, fortunately, I'm pleased to announce. But the thing is that, you know, uh, Days at Sea had to do with uh, supposedly my erotic fantasies as a sailor. And uh, we know that, that sex doesn't look the way it feels. And I, I was, it was very hard to make a specifically erotic photograph that, that, that functions in, in a, in a uh, emotional context. So that picture happens to be one that's explicitly erotic, but has certain formal, formal properties that enable it to exist. You know. The Black Trilogy, obviously the, the reference to the, the look that you had doing black and white film back then, the imperfections of it, the things that you're known for. Um, moving to color is a bold move. I think artists tend to get pigeonholed into they're known for this. I think everybody probably fights with that at some point. Was there a reaction, and maybe it was something you didn't care about, was there a reaction to your move to doing color later? No. no. I have to say that uh, I had tried some early, extremely minimal color, just uh, close-ups of brick walls and this and that. And I, uh, I showed them at Castelli, in my second show at Castelli, and ran into I, I received some flack for that particular exhibit. And there were just close-ups of tiles, and, and they were very geometric. And uh, I did, it, it, the, the show was essentially, uh, essentially, criticized, Art Forum liked it, but a lot of photographers didn't. But what I learned from that moved me into the Black series, the architectural, which I wound up showing at Pompidou. So, I mean... Uh, it did okay. It did okay. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you know uh, we get into a situation where you need recognition in order to be able to make a living in order to be able to do your work. On the other hand, if you have recognition, that means people are looking and saying what they think about your work. And you really cannot listen to them. It's very, very dangerous. First, once you have an audience, to listen to it. And that's, of course, a contradiction in, in motion. But uh, it's very contrapuntal that way. Uh, I, just, I just feel that I have to remain true to my muse and, and, and will therefore prevail.